My name is Ashley Chalky, Senior Director of Content and Experience at Momentum, and it is my great pleasure to introduce President of Tricity and now at Wharton's second customer centricity summit speaker, Rior Arusi. Rior's work has impacted 220 million customers and 375,000 employees in 21 countries. He is also the author of five books on customer experience, employee engagement, and experience innovation. Welcome, Lior. Hi. Thank you very much for having me today. Our pleasure. So, Lior, tell us a bit about Trativity and how it is changing the ways organizations view customer engagement. Well, Trativity fills in a very interesting uh, space in the marketplace. When uh, when we established Trativity, we were we started with a very single question, which is how can we improve the way customers and companies get together and stay together? And when we were searching for answers for that, uh, we often will hear very fragmented answers based on what's the core competence of the organization that's answering the question. So, you know, if you're a research company, you'll say, well, we'll just do the right research and we'll give you the answers. Or if you're a training company, you'll say, we'll do training and all your employees are going to be all of a sudden customer-centric. And we realize that no one is owning the complete transformation from the first diagnostic all the way to training the last employee in the organization. So, Strativity was designed for companies who wanted to make the shift from product centricity to customer centricity because they understand it's a much more profitable way to run a business, but they did not have the tools to really drive this type of change and transformation across all these different dif disciplines from research to prioritization to strategic planning to innovation to communication, to change management, all the way to preparing the last employee. That's where Strativity plays. We're in a very, very unique place with a methodology-based approach that helps organizations accelerate their customer-centric transformations. Okay. You will be presenting on transforming corporate culture and eliminating employee cynicism at Knowledge at Wharton's second Customer Centricity Summit. Share with us what you mean by eliminating employee cynicism and why this is important. So when you're a product-centric organization, you, your focus is that your value proposition is all about product features and product pricing and product placement and so on and so forth. But in, in reality today, with the high transparency that organizations and the customers have in terms of uh, products and services, there is a shift in the value proposition, and it's really all about the relationship and the experiences that we create for our customers. And the moment organizations understand that their value proposition, their competitive advantage, is around customer experience, it's around customer relationships, then very quickly we are now uh, focusing more on the way employees engage with customers, directly or indirectly, through different channels. It can be the website, it can be social media, it can be call centers, it can be a retail branch, it can be salespeople at the customer office. So uh, all of a sudden, uh, employees became from kind of operators of the product to the front of the value proposition. And unfortunately, many of them are not ready to engage and bring the brand authentically to every customer. They're not ready necessarily to come and be the brand ambassadors that, and, and, and to provide the passion that customers are seeking as part of how they see the value, which is alignment with values, alignment with ethics, alignment with experience. And, and employee cynicism, if we look at what happened to this economy for the last you know, uh, five to six years, employees have been going through a lot of turbulence. Some of them have let go, find another job, uh, cost cutting, economy was kind of on a shaky ground. Do I have a job? Do I not have a job? Uh, management is trying to squeeze more out of it. And, and, and what took the first beating is employee spirit. Uh, many of them are cynical. They are very hesitant to absorb and accept new initiatives, to believe in them authentically, let alone go and represent them to the customers. And that's what we talk about when we talk about uh, employee cynicism. Um, cynicism is a cancer in, in corporate productivity. And if you don't address it head on, if you don't do something to combat that and eradicate it from the organization, then you are hurting the core of the value proposition of the organization and its ability to differentiate. Wow, very interesting. Now, the second Customer Centricity Summit will have a heavy focus on navigating the barriers and obstacles organizations encounter when implementing a customer-centric strategy. In addition to corporate culture, what are some of the other challenges your clients face? 
So when when you look at it, corporate culture is definitely one one element. But I think oftentimes we see that that customer centricity is being treated as an incremental change, not as an order of magnitude change. So on a strategic level, corporate uh, corporations are not understanding that this is their way to differentiate. This is not just a nice to have thing. Uh, so management is there, kind of uh, not giving a full commitment to that side. So that's that's I would say. Um, uh, obstacle number one. Obstacle number two, for a moment, uh, for a sec- uh, for example, is companies believe that they're already delivering it, that it's not that bad, that it's you know it's you know that delivering a good experience. Because otherwise, how come they made their numbers? And we often tell them, you made your numbers because you lowered your price. You made your numbers because you were running short-term uh, campaigns. Uh, with coupons and discounts and flash sales, and that's not customer retention. That's the, that's the educating customers that the only way to buy from you is on a, on a deal. They're not you're not preparing them to stay connected. So believing that we are doing it is another area. I think that another area that many many organizations are struggling with is if you look at CEOs, many of them came from operation or from finance, and and for the last 20, 30 years they were running their career and their success on pie charts and graphs. And all of a sudden, we're putting a face, a face of an employee, a face of the customer right there in front of them. It says, this is what you need to start you know, managing and relating and engaging. And many of them are not comfortable with it. They, they, want, they want to go back to the pie charts. You know, Life is much easier and nicer when you've got pie charts and graphs. And I didn't mention that before, but, you know, so really we work with a wide variety of industries and brands out there, all the way from Mercedes-Benz, where we took them to become number one in customer satisfaction in less than two years, to Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, to FedEx, to MasterCard. So we're seeing some of these challenges uh, really across different types of industries, uh, where, where they kind of talk the talk, but when it comes to operationalizing it, to preparing it for the last employee, that kind of lacking. And, and I guess the last thing I would add to that, in short, is oftentimes these type of strategies are designed for the C-level, for the boardroom, but they're not designed for Susan from accounting. What is she supposed to be doing differently? How are we going to align her measurements and her tools and her empowerment to make sure that she can actually deliver to it? So oftentimes a lot of these customer-centric strategies they stay at the sea level in a boardroom in a beautiful PowerPoint, but it's not being operationalized, and that will be another major obstacle. Okay, and finally, if product centricity has always been the norm, then what motivates companies to make the switch to customer centricity? What benefits can customer centricity offer that product centricity cannot? So the first thing that we actually start with clients when they come to us and say, we want to improve customer experience, we want to become customer-centric, we'll ask exactly this question, which is why. Did you make your numbers last year? Did you make your financial targets? Because if you did, then then, then what's the problem? And we always start with them with the process we call economics of customer experience. And what we try to identify is exactly that delta between where they are today and what they're missing. So... In contrast to product centricity, which is uh, predicated on the, the traditional four Ps, product, pricing, placement, and promotion, we actually teach them to start focus, focusing on customer action, such as strong preference for your brand, premium price, your ability to actually command above the market averages, um, portion of budget, what portion of the total wallet share do you capture, permanence of relationship and promotion to others, but not just willingness to promote, but actual uh, references and leads that you get from customers. Because those five Cs that I just described are the true drivers for why companies want to become customer-centric. They want to focus on customer retention because cost of acquiring new customers and servicing new customers is growing exponentially for them. So it's a method of reducing the cost of doing business, it's a method of maximizing the current relationships that they have, and it's a method of creating a fulfillment for the brand promise, because many companies will have a brand promise that says, we're customer-centric, we'll do whatever it's right for you, but they're not actually fulfilling it, and the cost of not fulfilling it uh, is, is quite high. But ultimately, it goes back to the economics of customer experience and the five P's I just mentioned to you. Strong preference for the brand, premium price, portion of budget, permanence of relationship, and promotion to others.
Excellent. Well, those are all the questions I have for you today. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us, and I certainly look forward to continuing this conversation this December in San Francisco. Thank you very much. Looking forward to uh, joining you in San Francisco.